In this final presentation, we're going to consider the consequences of not performing some form of balance testing in infants with sensory neural hearing loss and also potential cochlear implant patients. Now, important populations in audiology, as we've said so far in our presentations today, some of the important populations in audiology where we want to consider balance uh, and vestibular investigations are children presenting with sensory neural hearing loss. It's within that group that we have seen the greatest prevalence and relationship between vestibular impairment and inner ear impairment overall. And certainly when we look at some of the tests that um, we mentioned a little bit earlier in the previous presentation, the, the BOT test, the BOT2 test, uh, looking at functional balance, you can see here a representation of the different tests within that from uh, tandem eyes open right the way through to the, the balance beam with one foot and eyes closed at the very end of that scale. And what we can see is as those tasks get more challenging, even children with normal hearing and normal vestibular function cannot complete the full 10 seconds. But we can see that relationship with uh, patients with cochlear implants, for example, showing a much bigger change in their ability to be able to complete the tasks, uh, but also to be able to do them over the same period of time uh, that a child with normal hearing would be able to. So quite a clear indication of a change in balance function in a patient with a cochlear implant related to their sensory neural hearing loss than a child with normal uh, hearing. Interestingly, when we also look at some of the data that's been uh, published by uh, Professor Sharon Cushing uh, in Toronto in Canada uh, from the Sick Kids uh, Hospital. We can look at horizontal canal dysfunction being significantly more associated with sensory neural hearing loss. And you, you can see from the graphic here, and we'll, we'll touch upon this a little bit more as well, that the difference between in this particular group, the cochlear implant group, those that had uh, horizontal canal dysfunction, so vestibular dysfunction, had a greater chance of reimplantation of the cochlear implant than those that had successful vestibular function or, or little vestibular impairment. So there is a, a relationship actually between um, having reimplantation, so a failure of the first cochlear implant, and vestibular function. And that relationship may be not 100% clear, but we'll touch on some of that in, in a little while as well. So when we look at um, patients with bilateral vestibular loss, uh, we said before that their, their score was around about four on the BOT test versus the children with a hearing loss who had around about 12 versus normal hearing uh, children who were around about 15. Now their score on the bilateral vestibular loss group, so this these are the groups that we're talking about who have um, reduced vestibular sensory information from both ears, equates to about the same balance score as a four and a half year old. Children with sensory neural hearing loss having an associated uh, hearing impairment. Now, the, the data would suggest that 30 to 40 percent of those children could have one of these bilateral vestibular impairments, so both vestibular systems being uh, involved. And if that gives them a vestibular um, impairment that, uh, that means they plateau from a balanced functional perspective at four and a half, we're not talking about children who are unable to move around. Now, if we can all just imagine and picture, you know, the four, the average four, four to four and a half, five year old, we know that they can move around quite successfully. But what, what they can't do is they, they start to struggle at more complex tasks. So generally by the age of about four and a half, five, children are moving on to riding a bike and doing more complex balancing tasks. And in actual fact, our, our life becomes a lot more complicated. As we, and as children get older and move towards teenagers and, and more towards adulthood, then obviously the tasks of balance and the environments that they find themselves in become more complex. So the ability to balance at four and a half may be quite successful when you are four and a half, but as you get older and older, that becomes a much more significant balance impairment. You can imagine being an adult with a balance function of a four and a half year old, uh, that would be quite a significant impairment in, in terms of your mobility and moving around. So there, there are things then that we need to consider as that child gets older. 
fundamentally, they're at a greater risk of fall. Now, interestingly, that slide that we showed earlier, looking at children with poor vestibular sensory information and reimplantation from cochlear implants, some of the data that's coming through on that case is are looking at potentially micro trauma that's been sustained uh, by the, the head that actually may be causing the cochlear implant to, uh, to fail. And that could be in relation to uh, the child just being unaware of how they're moving around and bumping and scraping as children do, more so than, than a child with successful vestibular sensory information. So it's something to consider having some knowledge about because it means that uh, you can intervene a little bit earlier in terms of uh, both looking at um, methods that may prevent or uh, reduce the risk um, of the child um, having uh, falls, for example. Now, the other things that we need to consider about from vestibular function perspective is we mentioned a little bit earlier in terms of vestibular assessment, the vestibular ocular reflex, that ability to test semicircular canal function by looking at the eye behavior when we're moving our head quite rapidly. Well, the vestibular ocular reflex, as it matures, becomes very sensitive and precise. And in fact, um, we've got a what is a relatively old reference here for some of us, um, but actually one that, that describes the vestibular ocular reflex very, very nicely, in that it only requires a few degrees of error per second between the retina and the target, so in other words, the thing that you're looking at, to degrade visual acuity. Now, in an adult, what we typically see is they, they will be walking around and they will describe to us the environment blurring and that they can't see very clearly. And that, that means they become unsteady and dizzy and disorientated. Now, in a child's perspective, this could impair their ability to read. And so seated at a desk, trying to read, moving their head around in a classroom, uh, that this could actually make what they're looking at very, very blurry. It, just at the very early part of their life, they start to reach challenges that educationally could have significant impacts in their in throughout their lifespan so just even being aware of, of that in terms of uh, uh, another challenge that they're trying to overcome um, means that intervention can be applied a lot earlier or certainly taken into account in being aware of some of the additional educational challenges that a child may be facing as a result of balance and vestibular disruption um, that, that uh, could be overcome with the correct intervention or certainly reduced. When we start to look at the much more complex pattern of brain building, so now this is really when we're, when we're looking at children and we're looking at hearing intervention, overall what we're trying to do is give them equal opportunity to access the environment and the world around them to achieve uh, the level that they want to in life and have the same access as a child who has normal uh, or satisfactory hearing. Part of that brain building from an auditory perspective is having access to sound as we know. But actually part of building a brain is also having access to sensory information for balance. So we spoke a little bit earlier about the touch and feel somatory sensory senses and modelling the position of the body and the space and the environment. We've spoken a little bit about the vestibular and vision elements of sensory weighting. The brain has to actually build a complex model to deal with when vision becomes unreliable and using other sensory information for balance and vice versa. These internal models are cognitive. They're reflexive. They run in the subconscious system, but they have to be built and constructed. And this is done throughout the neural plasticity that occurs predominantly in the younger child as they move towards teenage years. So these cognitive internal models, as we can see at the very top there, these allow the child to move around in what effectively is a, a normal environment. But it's not just about moving around in terms of balance. It's also about navigation, about being able to plan routes. There's all sorts of complex stuff that we do to enable us to move around that is much more complex than just actually standing and moving and walking. So the role of balance in the childhood development is actually a lot more complex. Here we've just sort of summarised them in terms of the, the cognition, learning and attainment element in terms of being able to access equally the same uh, methods uh, as a child that doesn't have any impairment. 
peer-to-peer -peer interactions, just moving and socializing and being able to do the same sorts of activities is also key. Part of that uh, is having good access to sound, but also part of that is being able to balance and move freely. So that ability to play and interact independently, very much related to uh, good access to sensory information like the vestibular system. And the connection and interaction with the surrounding environment. Again, this is a key element in terms of, uh, of the developing child. So actually part of what we're trying to do when we're looking at children with sensory neural hearing loss and looking at interventions such as hearing aids, for example, or cochlear implantation as we've moved into today, part of that is also looking at other elements that may be also impaired, such as the vestibular system. Now, the developing brain is is got a lot of neuroplasticity, and that's really what we uh, maximise on in terms of early intervention. And part of that um, uh, plasticity is also around building these, as we've said, models for sensory conflict, sensory reweighting, um, and also the learning of postural limits. Part and parcel of balance function is knowing for the brain to know how far we can lean, how far we can turn, how far we can uh, move in a certain direction and still be within our safe limits. All of these things are acquired throughout our childhood as the brain develops. So having access to some of that information or interventions to help us overcome a deficit is really key uh, early on. As we said, in adults, whenever we assess balance, it's really from the perspective of a system that has been fully formed, fully maturated, models uh, working correctly, and then we find something that changes. In a child, it's, it's an inclining system. It's a developing system. So knowing how to intervene early on really means that we need to do some early identification. And why, why is that obviously important? Well, we've touched on this a, a lot. Childhood is, is really about interacting with um, your peer group, the environment around you, and, and learning about all sorts of elements to keep you safe. So some of the behaviours that sometimes we might see in children could have a relationship towards their balance function and vestibular function as much as anything else. We see certainly descriptors in the um, in the literature looking at phobic syndromes, particularly with vestibular dysfunction. All of these are described in adults, so telling us what can happen when an adult system changes through, uh, through a lesion or, or through an impairment. And a lot of these are described as phobias from various different things. So we can see some of these early references, street neurosis. So a patient describing feeling uh, dizzy or, or fearful when they're out, supermarket syndrome in complex environments, phobic postural syndrome, space phobia, space and motion discomfort. So certainly when we talk around uh, the very beginning of today's session, we were talking around observing cling clingy behavior in children sometimes where they feel confident when they're with their carer, their guardian, their parent, but less confident when they're on their own. Some of these can be a representation of them not having the sensory information to maintain their balance and therefore they feel that they are struggling when in these uh, more complex environments uh, and as such become ang anxious and fearful. As we bring this a little bit more towards a close, there's a nice um, article um, that you can access online, um, Vestibular Dysfunction in Children with Sensory Neural Hearing Loss. Uh, it's quite a nice synopsis uh, talking around where we started, where we are now and where we're going to um, by a, a group of key opinion leaders in this particular field. And uh, some of the summary that comes from that particular article, and again, uh, it's open access, uh, if you uh, if you Google search this, that concurrent vestibular dysfunction, as we've said, is present in up to 70% of children with sensory neural hearing loss. So it's a factor that we need to um, take into account when potentially assessing uh, and those children. Children with inner ear malformations or acquired infectious causes, we've already uh, spoken about, are the most likely to demonstrate some vestibular deficiencies when we start to test them. So that's in the that 35 to 40% group 
and vestibular imbalance impairment contribute to cochlear implant failure. And part of that relationship uh, is developing still within the research world. But if we're looking at cochlear implantation and we have underlying balance dysfunction as well, it's whether or not uh, just through normal interactions with the environment, play and so forth, that the head may sustain some micro trauma. So not major trauma, but micro trauma that could be enough to create a failure within the cochlear implant system which requires then re-implantation and obviously a second general anaesthetic and all of the, uh, the trauma anxiety associated with surgery as well. Pediatric uh, otologists and pediatricians uh, should aim to um, look at practical strategies. So this is within this particular article to screen for vestibular dysfunction in deaf children. So children with hearing impairment, th there is now a growth of tools. And we've said some of them could be looking at just functional screening initially and standardized scoring and looking at whether the scoring gives us some indication. Moving as the child gets a little bit more older towards diagnostic tests of, of vestibular function as well. So the rotational chair, the video head impulse testing, um, VEMP testing, so invoked myogenic potential testing. And we can even move into further functional tests such as uh, platform testing, computerized dynamic posturography as well. So where we are really in the assessment and management of sensorineural hearing loss, looking at children moving towards hearing intervention, is considering that presence of an associate vestibular imbalance impairment. And, and really, as we start to study this in a little bit more detail, we may find that actually this is a lot more frequent than even some of the data that we currently have. It's really a fairly new area, although we've known around uh, vestibular dysfunction in children um, from the early and mid 90s when we started to move towards bilateral CI, but actually looking at this even in, in hearing intervention. So when we're providing hearing aids for children with sensory neural hearing loss could be a, a key factor as well. And that having some sort of multidisciplinary team management to achieve the best developmental outcomes for each child with sensory neural hearing loss or, or cochlear implantation. And that that could be what we've just spoken around here, which is really using the, the balance system to create an interaction with the environment that is equally as important as access to sound so that they can actually utilize uh, the intervention more successfully as well. So to close this uh, this part down in summary, we know there are challenges to overcome vestibular imbalance cases in children. Uh, it's an area that um, that does require some more multidisciplinary team working, whether that's with vestibular services, vestibular audiologists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists and so forth. But we know that vestibular impairment is singularly the most common associated feature of sensory neural hearing loss. So it's in, it's important that we do at least start to consider this and that that presence of a vestibular impairment can impact a child's development way beyond the functional aspects of a balanced mobility issue because it's about interactions, uh, it's about cognitive development and brain building. And so at that point, we'll just bring this particular section to a close and we can discuss a little bit further some of the elements in your experience as well. Thank you.